emo bands. Bands of musicians who write and perform rock music characterized by melodic musicianship and expressive, often confessional lyrics and streamed vocals. Emo music originated in the mid-1980s with the hardcore punk movement of Washington, D.C., where it was known as emotional hardcore and was pioneered by bands such as Rites of Spring and Embrace. By the early 2000s, emo splintered into numerous subgenres, including emo pop and screamo, and continued to take the world by storm as the emo movement made huge splashes in mainstream culture. But who are these legendary band leaders and vocalists who shaped so many of our lives in ways that could never truly be appreciated. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna to be sitting down with legendary emo band leaders to learn the truth about this rock star lifestyle. Do these band leaders find joy in their relentlessly demanding rock star lifestyle? Or has the unforgiving music industry left them emotionally drained by the agony of their constant battle for musical relevance? Spencer! What's up, man? Shane! What's up, Anthony? Matt! Hi! How's it going? Thank you so much for coming on here and teaching me about the world of legendary emo band leaders. Hey, man. That's my pleasure. You know, funny enough, I've actually uh, labeled myself with the moniker King of Emo LLC as of recently. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> what do you consider yourself? An emo band leader? Uh, someone part of a band with an undefined music genre? From when we first started, if people want to call us emo or they want to call us like anything, we're, we don't really care. I'm, I try to be a jack of all trades and all things, uh, guitar, rock oriented these days. To me, I'm just, I'm a songwriter. You know, I've, I always have been, I've been playing music um, my whole life. What is your band and what do you think is your most popular song? My band is called From First to Last and our most popular song I'm gonna say it's a toss up between Note to Self and Emily. My band is Silverstein. And the most popular song, I gotta give it to our song from 2005 called My Heroine. My band is a band called Under Oath. I, I think our probably our most popular song is probably Writing on the Walls, which was on our second record, or A Boy Brush Red, Living in Black and White, which was on our first record. Yeah, that's that's um, one that always comes to mind for me. Those are the two songs that, I mean, we'll always play live, mm -hmm. you know, for the rest of our lives, probably. What does being a frontman for a band entail? I mean, you don't worry about your hair as much these days, I guess is the first thing. <laughs> it was always it was always the swoop. You had to have the swoop. I still have the barber leave some some length in the front, you know? Uh, but seriously, no, it's, it's really just all about kind of being the bridge between the audience and the band and the music. And, you know, you're facilitating all of that. You're, you're kind of the face of the band to a certain degree because you're the voice that they hear. Absolutely. I have a podcast every week and I have, you know, lead singers on it. And I had Dee Snider, you know, legendary front man of Twisted Sister. Yeah. And he's, he put it best when he said, you're standing up there with pretty much only your dick between you and the audience. That's true. That's just you and your voice and your personality that has to, you know, determine all of these people what they are going to experience. You have to have like a level of confidence where like you never second guess yourself. And it's uh -huh. like, you think about bands where it's like corn. Think about corn, right? Like think yeah. about the first time Jonathan Davis, the singer, walked in the booth and went, and then I was like, mm, well. So it's like, man, like you have to have a crazy low comments to be like, nah, dog, that's the And you're like, are you sure? And like, yep. Where did you first hear the term emo and what did it mean to you? You know, when I went to high school, I guess that there were, you know, shows and even in just my local suburban community, there were bands playing and some of these bands were playing like really, different music that I never heard before because it wasn't on the radio or anything like that, you know? Sort of this offshoot that sort of was in the shadows that was just, you know, bubbling uh, was called emo. I understood it as being, it stood for like emotional hardcore. So it was basically like those heavy hardcore bands, but it was like the kind of, I don't know, the sad side of it, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're not the, afraid to let the, your heart spill. A little right. Bit. That was what emo was. It was basically like you take hardcore and and to a lesser extent punk, mm -hmm. and you kind of blend them together. And then the songs are basically not 
a, not political at all. Every band from Fall Out Boy to Bring Me the Horizon is for some reason classified as emo to many people. Why do yeah. you think the, the genre spans so many different sounds? I think really what it was, was it was all came down to the image of it. The fashion trends and whatnot. Right, and because Pete Wentz was painting his nails and had wearing makeup and had this little swoop, uh -huh. um, a fairly small swoop. He just had the why. baby swoop. But I honestly think that um, people saw what they saw more than they heard what they heard. Yeah. And it was easy enough to kind of just say, oh, that's that's emo, you're an emo, I don't like emos or whatever, and it, you know. Do you consider your band emo? And a lot of people didn't think my band was emo for a long time, but the fact that I'm here right now talking to you <laughs> about being, what was it? You said legendary, a legendary emo band leader, yes. Because of that, I think that we are officially now an emo band. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe, I think maybe our first record was yeah. kind of considered. Yeah, Chasing Safety. Yeah, kids call it Screamo, yeah. which I hate that word. Screamo? <laughs> That's so, so funny because, but as a kid, I heard Screamo and I thought it was a cool word. Yeah. I was like, emo, but like the streaming. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> so sick. <laughs> Under Oath is, is a weird one though. Like we kind of always were throwing a wrench in the system. And I think that's because there's six of us that don't agree on anything. <laughs> so every record we make sounds so different. It does. Every record yeah. is very different. So like if someone were to ask now, I would just say we're, just a, we're a rock band. We're yeah. like a hard rock band. The there's, same, there's always heavy elements. There's no sense of like emo anymore. And there's yeah. no like screamo. It's just kind of like, it's like what I would consider the Deftones, but we're not as cool. In so. my heart, you're just as but cool. Thank you. <laughs> Before we learn more about the world of legendary emo band leaders, I just want to take a quick moment to mention that this episode has clearly been in the works for quite a while because I wanted to get the perfect guests for this episode. And I really feel like we accomplished that. Obviously. I'm also coming to terms with the fact that my emo phase was not just a phase and I'm still such a big fan of all these bands and so many similar genres across the entire spectrum. And with that said, please press a like if you want to see more episodes like this one and leave a comment letting me know which other genres and artists you'd like me to spend a day with. And you know, I'm sure that future potential guests would be stoked if they see your overwhelming enthusiasm. I appreciate all of you in supporting me in the series and, and giving me the chance to live out some of my dreams that I honestly, I, I never thought that I would actually be able to achieve. That's all I wanted to say. Now back to learning about the world of legendary emo band leaders. Do you think that term emo has hurt or helped your band at all? I think it had to have helped in some way or another. The people out there that like were into it knew what they were looking for. And although I would be shocked if someone didn't know who we were and like that music in that era, the people that hated that term hated us. And I think all that hate that we got probably helped make us bigger too. Cause when people are talking about you, you're- That's true. Any attention is good attention. Well, not always, but you know, sometimes. There's a few, there's a few <laughs> examples of why it's not, but we'll leave those out yeah. of this. I think the word nostalgia hurts people more. We've got lucky because we broke up and got back together and yeah. made a record. And uh -huh. I think that's where people are getting confused with like the nostalgia, emo night, emo this, emo yeah. that. It doesn't really have to be a phase. It could just be a genre of music that people enjoy. Why do you think emo music exploded in such a big way in the early to mid 2000s? I think that it, it for a lot of people, it was really fresh. And for younger people looking to be a part of something that wasn't I don't know, mainstream. I think that it was it was kind of easy and it was something that people really believed in. I mean, every high school kid is feels all these like this mishmash yeah. of craziness and emotions and mood swings and like mm -hmm. this I think was the one thing that could really bring, you know, people together uh, for people that felt alone. There was an entire movement that supported the idea of not being afraid to talk about your emotions and the pain you were going through. Yes, exactly. MySpace is taking off and people mm -hmm. are connecting through these. Mm -hmm. And I think they just kind of blew the whole thing up. People finally had a, a place to find like-minded people. The very first social media and with that music happening and those are the kind of people that are using it, that mm -hmm. age demographic, mm -hmm. and they're connecting. Mm -hmm. So four people in my high school listen to Hawthorne Heights and I get made fun of for it, but I found 500 people online. And you then know? you feel accepted and you start embracing your, your music taste, your sense exactly. of fashion. 
and, and then it kind of boomed that way. And they're going, hey, have you heard this band? Have yeah. you, you like that? Have you, you know? And yeah. I think that was that was just huge. Are you nostalgic for those early days at all? It would be kind of weird to not feel nostalgic about like a great time in your life, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, I mean, not not in any kind of way where I'm just like, oh my god, like ever since then, life has been. It gives me such a nostalgic feeling for that time in my life, and I can oh. only imagine what like actually being up there on stage, how that probably felt even bigger for you too. The feeling you get when you're walking out on the stage and it just sounds like white noise blasting because people are yelling and screaming. Like, yeah. I'm like getting a little like wet in my <laughs> eyes thinking about it right now. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's it's unreal, man. Like, it feels like your body's firing in all cylinders. I, I feel like if, if you aren't, or you say you're not nostalgic, you're kind of lying, I think, or maybe mm. you're just you're just like you don't have a heart because <laughs> for me like those times were so magical and you ne you'll never have them again that stuff is is near and dear to my heart and i'm glad we have that stuff as you grow older and your musical taste continues to evolve how do you manage to appeal to longtime fans and the mainstream market while also being true to yourself for us like i think every step of the way we're just really cautious about making the best material not following any trends. I went back and listened to your entire catalog and you, like, I feel like every album still stands the test of time. And I could tell that you guys weren't like trapped in like, I need, we need to appeal to the trends right now. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and our fan base has been so awesome, but we also recognize that they are our lifeblood and they've allowed us to do this for now 20 years. How do you feel when people demand that you play your old stuff? It would be, really ridiculous to not feel anything but happy or grateful for that because you're talking about songs I wrote when I was 19 years old and I am now 36 and people are still fans of them and want to hear them like I couldn't think of anything more flattering in the world than that that's insane to me I think only we're just like no because we, we consider that like what's old like we, we make a record every, every yeah. couple of years you know? yeah it's like, yeah didn't you release an album a compilation album called play your old stuff yeah that was just a middle finger to <laughs> it was a funny joke we're, we're like we're, we're serious and the songs and the lyrics are really serious but yeah our band jokes around all the time have you ever had a fanboy moment when sharing the stage or a tour with another band 2008 war tour when i was singing for the band um it was Angels and Airways on the tour. And uh, we, we shared the main stage. So like uh, I ended up somehow or another conversing with Tom one day and I was just like, whoa, yeah. this is crazy. Like, I, you know, I wouldn't even be in a band if it wasn't for you. Like quite literally, that's not even just a thing. Like I would not yeah. be in a band if it wasn't for that guy. Yeah. And he was just like, hey, yeah, I love your voice. And I was like, oh God, that's crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we ended up hanging out that summer, like a lot. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Like we would like smoke a joint oh. and he'd tell me about alien videos. And that, and, <laughs> like, yeah, he'd be like, dude, I got this video of this lady who found an alien in the woods with her dog and the CIA is asking me for it back and they're coming for me. And I was like, holy <laughs> this is no, it's like, you're, you're, you're telling like, how the truth. high am I? <laughs> no, because it's crazy either way. He's either telling the truth yeah. that it's crazy or he's not. Yeah. That's crazy too. And you're like, whatever, yeah. either way, this is crazy. Um, and Katy Perry was on the tour that year too. So like we did this whole thing. I can't believe Katy Perry was on Warp Tour. Yeah, like we pranked her. I put a mustache on her face on the side of her bus. Oh my God. And uh, she like had her bus driver put a dead fish in my pillow. A dead so, yeah, fish. dude. And it was, it was wild. It was a wild time. I am in line for catering i ask about the option for vegetarians uh -huh. so they bring out this other plate of like the salad so i go to get it and all i hear beside me is damn that looks good <laughs> so i i <laughs> i turn back and i realize it's slash and i had something to say to whoever said that but when i realized it was slash uh -huh. uh, 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 <laughs> that was verbatim what I said to Slash. I think he probably gets that a lot though. To which he just said, can I get that too? <laughs> to, the, to the person working. Worst and best emo fashion trend, go. The sidekick. Dude, sidekicks were They were amazing. so good. Amazing. A physical keyboard that you pulled down. I remember the first time I saw 
a T-Mobile sidekick, and uh -huh. I thought to myself, it, it can never get better than this. The, the pinnacle <laughs> of mobile communication. I, I don't know if that's an emo-specific trend, but it sure felt like it was. It felt like an emo trend. Every single scene girl I knew had a sidekick. You could not be a scene girl without a sidekick. No, they were so good. Worst was the swoop hair. <laughs> what, you mean just the fringe in general? Just like the skunk thing. Oh, you know, oh, like yeah, the, yeah. The spiky this, the spike in the back. The yeah, the skunk. I never quite got into that. But I, I never did it. I definitely thought there were hot girls doing that. Yeah, I never Should... did the... Did you straighten I... your hair though? I did, that yeah. was terrible. <laughs> Damn it. Probably just like the shirts that just weren't big enough for you. Two oh, small shirts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't oh, yeah. need to like when you bend over, you can see half your back. <laughs> I loved my old shirts where I'd like stretch and you just see like my belly button hair. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you can wear a shirt that fits you, man. It's all good, I promise. <laughs> it was a very cool period where there there was that transition from people wearing clothes that were very big to people, you know, guys wearing skinny jeans and stuff like that. You literally had to go to the girls section of the store to find them. It was yeah. It was, it was kind of a cool movement where people, it was like an anti mainstream culture. Of course, yeah. yeah, it played all into the lifestyle. Everything about it was like the anti, you know, like yeah. Go to Gap to find girls jeans as a guy, like, you know, like <laughs> that seems so ridiculous back then. And it kind yeah. of does now too because they're like, well, I mean, they make plenty of jeans for guys to fit. I feel like I was also drawn to the movement back then because guys weren't afraid to spend time on their hair, wear clothes that were tighter, you know, paint their nails or do makeup if they wanted. And it just felt like a, a moment of expression where guys mm -hmm. weren't necessarily being shamed within their circles for, for doing these things that were traditionally seen as more feminine. Yeah, it was cool. It was kind of like a... Uh like a release for a lot of people to like kind of like let like take that shroud off of like fake masculinity a little bit yeah you know yeah. you're always like living up to these standards stuff by like you know like your parents or like society or whatever in a lot of ways many bands at the time including yours was helping showcase to to many people including me that it was okay to feel these emotions and it was okay to talk about them and it was okay to express yourself with clothing that wasn't you know screaming masculine feeling comfortable to express yourself, mm -hmm. you know, without mm -hmm. any weird like judgments. Cause like, I think like there was this thing where it's like, guys just looked like <laughs> before that. And, yeah. like, no, you, <laughs> it's okay if you want to care. Bella wants to know what the craziest thing is that's ever been screamed at you at a show. A lot of smaller venues, they didn't have barricades or security or anything. So people are pushed right up against the stage. Some of the uh, females in the crowd sometimes were a little grabby. Ooh in places they shouldn't have been grabby. It was in St. Catharines, Ontario. She would not stop. So I kind of called her out like over the microphone. But I was like, hey, you know, and I kind of like, I tried to make a bit of a joke of it. Well, the music's like quiet and everything and I'm talking, all I heard her sc literally scream was, I want to have your babies. No. Like that is, no. that is definitely not happening. <laughs> You're like, you sexually assaulted me. That sounds great. Right. Dorna Weirdo 5 wants to know how much of the industry dictated your style and was there a time you wanted to you know, stray away from the emo scene but felt pressured to keep the genre for, for the fans? Zero. Zero, zero industry zero, dictation. Like, zero percentage. No record labels Less breathing down your throat never, or anything. Never, And that's like such a funny thing, I think, that, that will happen. Like a band will be on a label for a while and then they'll sign to a new label and mm. people will say like, the label made them change their sound. I'm gonna tell you right now, that pretty much never happens. There are a few labels um, that are a little more hands-on that uh -huh. might say to a band like, hey, why don't you know, you write maybe try a song like this or whatever. But for the most part in our experience, we never had a label tell us what to do. Most of our labels didn't even want to hear our records till we till we turned them in. Oh, nice. So, so you had was, freedom to do whatever. Anytime your music changed, yeah. it was because you guys wanted to put out something different. Yep, every, every step of the way. So we kind of controlled everything. At one point, our label wanted to, you know, make edits to make it more digestible, like, and take screaming out and stuff. And we were like, that, no, like, we don't care about stuff like that. Which album were they trying to well, take? Chasing Safety. They were like, trying to take, take screaming they out thought, of the album? They, th they didn't really understand it yet, you know? Like, wow. And we were just like, no, we're good. I can't imagine that album without yeah. screaming. Well, it was like certain songs they thought like, oh, this would be great for your career. And we're just like, nah, Yeah. we don't care. And they saw it as a bad decision, but at the time it was a great decision because then we would really would have been stuck playing the same style. So I think it was good. We're never going to be out through so fast. <laughs> 
Mariana Leon wants to know if you could delete one song from your band's entire existence and no one would ever remember it, would there be a song that you would delete? Downset Go. Downset Go? Why? Oh, it's so cheesy. I love that song. <laughs> I like that song. <laughs> oh, I mean, well, there's some really cheesy vocals on that one. All right, fine. <laughs> a tiny bit. I'm a halfway boy. Oh, wait, I'm just thinking something else. Come on. I'm a halfway boy. Yeah, that's a lyric and it's awful. Did you write that? No, I think I think Aaron might have been responsible. <laughs> Throw him right I'm under the bus. Gonna, I'm at least going to say it was him. Have you seen the American Idol clip where the dude came on and sang your song? No, my God! Lost in my throat! Oh, I've seen it. You've seen, what do you think about that? So I found the guy, his name's Ryan Hart. I found him on MySpace and this dude was getting like eaten alive. So I sent him a message. I was like, hey man, I think it's really cool like what you did. And we started like chatting. He's from Las Vegas. And the next time we played Las Vegas, he got on stage with us. He did the song. <laughs> yeah, we, we remained friends. We were buddies, you know? <laughs> Has being part of a band ever affected any of your relationships? I'm sure all of them. <laughs> Gets me your whole life, right? I mean, we're gone all the time, you know? And, it, and for most of my life, I put the band first. Yeah. It wasn't until recently to where I learned how to balance having a personal life in the band. Yeah, that's hard, right? You know, I'm in a great relationship now, but I'm ready to be in one. As I was younger, it was I was so invested because it's my, my words. It's my, like, it's it's like me. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. I'm like... Your band represents you. Yeah, that point. me and Aaron. Yeah. yeah. And, like, I would come home from tour and, and literally look at the calendar and be like, all right, I've got this much time to the next Under Oath event. I wasn't really a living at home. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the drinking and drugs came in at that time too, because it was just passing time. So did you I, feel most alive when you were on doing tour. stuff with the band? Yeah, always, yeah. That was like my life, you know? Yeah. It still is, it's a huge part of my life, but it's not, I don't consider it my only life anymore. What's been the most insane thing you've experienced while on tour? When we were on tour with Fall Boy, we played <laughs> Bam Boozle. You just said you say that so casually. <laughs> we had a dressing room here, they had a dressing room here, connected by a door. Uh -huh. And we were pretty deep into the tour at this point. We, had, we were pretty friendly. I mean, I had been friends with Pete for a very long time. It, we were just silly at that point, whatever. And honestly, to be fair, we were on a head, like on a tour that was completely sold out arenas every night. You know, we were all getting a little, you know, big headed, like. <laughs> right. Somehow this food fight broke out in between dressing rooms through this normal single a entrance. A food fight. Whole table of food, like vegetables, fruit, we're just like, Whoa, 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 like through it. It's just, it looks like bullets coming through. And then Wes is like this, this a whole garbage can, like the full size big ones, you know, like they're like this yeah. tall and it was full of shit. And he takes it and goes, woof, and throws it through the door. You hear it go, boom, and then lamps are flying through. Dude, I'm telling oh you. Oh my God, you just destroyed that place. Oh dude, it was <laughs> annihilated. So we both got fined twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> was it worth it? I mean, I'm talking about it now, right? <laughs> What's been your most bizarre fan interaction? The weirdest one. We were playing Chile, 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 and they the security guards had like guns. Oh, and they were like came to our tour manager and asked what the last song is because they're like we have to run you out like the bomb escape and i had to from the last note they were waiting and i came off and like i had to throw my backpack on and we had to run underneath and get in the van and leave and they're literally like zombie looking like chasing the van down the road like like banging on the windows like jump there was a guy riding on the back of the van holy like, shit. it's some on. world war z type up in it, here and we were just laughing i mean we thought it was i mean this is just crazy you weren't scared no but like it, it's wild but you know in, in south america I, I feel like they don't get as much music and if they're connected yeah. to you like it's like a big deal oh yeah you know? especially it's something that felt like an underground genre yeah so like they're i mean the shows are wild the shows are incredible i mean those people yeah. are so happy to have you yeah. but they express it over the top yeah. and it's a little bit dangerous we we're on tour with kiss so we're the only other band we had to open everyone hated us okay really well yeah because if we do the kiss no one wants to go see some brand new band they've ever heard of at a kiss show they're like get the f off the stage when we see kiss and go home yeah we I want rock and roll him. baby and i see this kid his dad's got his hand on his kid's shoulders they're both wearing full makeup 
and this kid is just like this. The whole <laughs> show. The like, whole show? Yeah, stone cold face, kiss makeup, middle finger. <laughs> It was unreal. I spent the whole time looking at this kid like, what is this guy's problem? <laughs> hey kid, if you're out there, f you. <laughs> yeah, f you. Piece of shit. Yeah, how does, it, how does it feel? How does it feel? Yeah, probably feels bad, huh? <laughs> what is it about being part of an emo band that has brought you the most joy? I think it's how much the music really means to people. You know, I think like if we were in a metal band or something, Someone might be like, yo man, that riff was really sick. Like I banged my head like so hard to that to that riff. Like I like seriously, I banged my head. But it, like people don't really come up to our band and say that. They come up to our band and say, that lyric you wrote, like I was literally going to kill myself the next, like that day. And I heard that song and something in your voice told me not to do it and told me to get help and here I am today and you know, I've worked my problems and here I am and like, thank you for that. What's crazy though, is I'm sure like a lot, I've heard a lot of other bands say that and it's become like almost cliche, but I don't care because there's nothing more important. I actually have a parting gift for you, a best interviewer shirt, which you could get Whoa. at padildoshop.com. But for you, my friend, I will ship this to you for free. Damn. 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 I know you always wanted a shirt that looks like it was designed by a five-year-old and I can provide that service to you for free. Yeah, I'm wearing it right now. Just paint <laughs> randomly splattered on a shirt. What's up, five-year-old? All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera. Go. They're called Niva, N-I-V-A. They are a charity that's helping out venues that are having trouble because of COVID-19. Check it out. Twitch.tv slash SmackGood with zeros. I'm gonna do a show on there. It's gonna start soon. Check it out. Under Oath Band on Instagram, mine is at WS Chamberlain because my legally first name is William, but I've always gone by Spencer, so don't call me William. Anthony Padilla, very, very nice guy, sweetheart. Uh, his shirt is okay, but he's really, really good at this stuff, and he really takes care of all of his guests and people he speaks to. So let's just do everyone a favor in the world and just hit the subscribe button right now. Smash it. Smash it into pieces. Thank you so much, Matt. I feel like I understand the world of being a legendary emo band leader a little bit more. I'm glad to hear that, dude. <laughs> one day we're gonna make you the next one. It was my dream growing up. Let's make it happen. I'll be in my 40s, but it's okay. Yeah, we'll dude, do it's it. cool. I got we'll you. We'll do it. I got you. Yep. <laughs> After spending the day with these legendary emo band leaders, I've come to realize just how much they've taken great pride in consistently challenging themselves and expressing their abilities as musical artists. These musicians truly deserve all the respect in the world for the impact they've made and just how much they've shaped so many of our lives. See you later, bye guys. Russell like. <laughs> how skinny are your jeans at the moment? At the moment, you they're, know what? Uh, you know what, they're still, you know, they're still there. Pretty, yeah. I never pretty quite drew out of them, yeah. No, no. <laughs> You never will. I don't think like, I ever I, will, yeah. I don't know if skinny jeans are falling out of favor a little bit or whatever. So yeah. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go to the store, maybe buy some jeans that aren't skinny jeans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I swear, like, they seem to think that my thigh is the same <laughs> size as my calf. Like, yes, yes. What? Dude, right? yeah, yeah. I, I, for some reason, non-skinny jeans are still, are still tight in the thigh. What the heck is going on, man? Who's designing these things? Right? I, I, don't... I know, I know. Yeah, I know, then you look man. like but, you got flares no. on and you're like, it's not the 90s, I can't do it what? anymore. This is why you're only seeing me from the, the tits up here, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, tits up is how we like to keep it. <laughs> <laughs>